Hello, we welcome you to the program today. The sermon, 2 Chronicles 28, 19. The title, Moral Decline. We'll be looking at this passage today. And so if you will, turn to your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 28. And let's begin. Moral decline refers to the process of becoming less moral or righteous. What is the standard of morality? For some, people consider their own feelings. And so it's a subjective standard. How do I feel about this? Does it feel right or feel wrong? Others may depend on a vote of a community, of, of a nation, or perhaps the courts. Do the courts decide morality, right or wrong? As Christians, we believe that the Holy Scriptures, inspired by God, to be that objective moral standard. Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so scripture given by inspiration of God, God breathed. According to the passage, instruction in righteousness. And so if we want to know what is right, we turn to the scriptures. As Christians, we believe that all will be judged. In 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so there is the expectation of the judgment day. And knowing that we will be judged by the Lord, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him. Unfortunately, many do not have that expectation of judgment. God has always revealed his will to humanity. This was true for the patriarchs, such as Abraham. This was true for the Jews under the law of Moses. And the Gentiles, who by nature did the things in the law, and who kept the righteous requirements of the law. And this is also true for all people today, too, who will be judged by the Lord. In Hebrews 1 and 1, the writer wrote, God, who at various times and in various ways spoken time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken us by his son, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God has always revealed his will. Will we heed his word? With the coming judgment in view of sin, there is the need for repentance. To repent is to turn to change one's heart acts 17 30 to 31 we learn that god commands all men everywhere to repent we learn in verse 31 that he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained even gives he has given assurance of this to all by rising him, raising him from the dead. That man by which we were judged is the Lord Jesus. And so there is the expectation of judgment. And so therefore, given the consequence of sin, repent. And so there is hope. Repent of your sins. Turn from your sins and turn back to righteousness. Turn back to God. Again, sadly, many no longer believe in the judgment. We see in Romans 1 28 how that Paul describes the sins of the Gentiles. He said, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, he said, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. 
Paul then lists a number of transgressions, a number of sins. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And so we see how that he said in verse 32, knowing the righteous judgment of God. And so even those who knew the judgment of God, how God will judge, went ahead and practiced these things, but not only practicing these things, but also approving of those who did the same. And so this is not an exhaustive list. We, we see other such sins described in the Bible. The Bible tells us what we need to do. And in this passage, we see that these things are condemned by God, knowing the righteous judgment of God. And that ought to motivate us. And we who have that fear of God will repent of our sins. Unfortunately, there are those who would not retain God and their knowledge, not wish to retain God and their knowledge. And God will give them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting in his eyes. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. You see, Solomon had tried many things, and in the end, he came to this conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. The greatest cause of moral decline is when a people no longer fear God and keep his word. But there is hope as you study the scriptures and trust in God. You learn to fear God, to revere him. You learn to love him. And we see this in the scriptures. One example is found in the book of Kings and Chronicles. In the books of Kings and Chronicles, we see many kings who ruled. A few who were even good, some better than others. But we see the effect that each had on their own people under their reign. Today, we will consider a king whose reign went from bad to worse, contributing to moral decline. And this king is named Ahaz. In 2 Chronicles 28, 1 to 4, 2 Chronicles 28, 1 to 4, we see a brief overview of the man's reign, and it wasn't good. I wonder what his standard of morality or righteousness was. Did he even have a standard? Well, let's see. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord as his father David had done, for he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made it molded images for Baals. He burned incense in the valley of the son of Henan and burned his children in the fire, according to the abominations of the nations, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. He did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. Second Timothy 3.16, we see the standard for righteousness being the scriptures. That the scriptures are given by inspiration of God and profitable for instruction in righteousness, 
here we see that this king, Ahaz, did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did not heed the word that was revealed to him. And so we see the immorality, the unrighteousness of the man, and how that he was given over to this debased mind to practice all sorts of, of idolatry and accompanying the idolatry, various kinds of immorality, of transgressions of, of the law of God. They no longer followed the law that they were under. Jotham, the father of Ahaz, did good during his reign, but even so, there were still people who acted corruptly. As you study the kings, you see the decline, the moral decline of the people. And while there were, were a few good kings, a few kings who tried to do good, who, who acted right in the sight of God, did what was right in the sight of the Lord, we see that there was still this moral decline. And while there were some improvements with the good kings, we see the decline with the evil. With the reign of Ahaz, he became more and more unfaithful. The morality of the people increased more and more. And the moral decline increased more and more. He did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. I suppose his standard, he did what was right in his own eyes. He had his own plans. And he followed them. He should have trusted in the Lord. Feelings change. The opinions of people change. Whether it's an individual, it's a group of people, family, could be a, a nation, but not the Lord. And he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. What caused this decline? Well, we're not told specifically, other than his lack of fear of the Lord. He did not trust in God. But there were th some threats to Ahaz, and certainly not to justify his immorality or his unfaithfulness, but we do see that there were threats to him, and he should have trusted in the Lord, but he didn't. Kings by the name of Reason, king of Syria, and Pekah, king of Israel, the northern kingdom, made war against Judah, which the southern kingdom, but could not prevail. We see this in 2 Kings 16.5. In, ah in Ahaz, we see Isaiah's account. Isaiah was a prophet of the Lord. And Isaiah spoke the word of the Lord to Ahaz. Ahaz heard that Syria's forces had allied themselves with Ephraim. He was afraid. So were the people. He should have led the people in faith, but did not. Isaiah told Ahaz that as long as Judah trusted in the Lord, these two kings would be of no threat to him and Judah. However, he did not believe or wish to believe, and so took matters into his own hands. He did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 7 describes this event. Ahaz paid the Assyrian kings. What did he do? What was his great plan? Well, we see his plan. King Ahaz sent to the kings of Assyria in order to receive their help. Ahaz even pledged to be a servant of the king of Assyria and even paid him. Now, the Assyrian king helped him in a limited way. The Assyrian king only helped him in a way that was beneficial to him and Assyria, which was not good for Judah. Second Kings 16, 7 to 9, we see that Ahaz sent messengers to the king of Assyria. And he said, I am your servant and your son. Here he's pledging service to this foreign king. He should have pledged his faithfulness to the Lord and did what was right in his sight and trusted in him. I am your servant and your son. 
He says, come up and save me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who rise up against me. What did he do? It says, and Ahaz took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the treasuries of the king's house and sent it as a present to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria heeded him for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it, carried its people captive to cure and killed reason. And so here we see that he pledged allegiance service to the king of Assyria and he paid the king of Assyria the silver and the gold and where did he receive the silver and the gold from the house of the Lord it's amazing to see his his decline in faith away from the Lord there were times of distress during the reign of the king Ahaz. Other threats came up as they always do. The Edomites had attacked Judah. The Philistines had invaded Judah. And the king of Assyria came to Ahaz. Ahaz gave part of the treasuries of the house of the Lord to the king of Assyria. However, the king of Assyria, according to the text, distressed Ahaz. How so? Well, he took the money, he took the treasures but did not help Ahaz as he wanted. We see that he defeated their enemy, but kept the, kept the place for himself. Second Chronicles 28, 16 to 21. So he was distressed. He should have stayed with Lord. We see the apostasy of Ahaz in Second Chronicles 28, 22 to 25. Now, in the time of his distress, King Ahaz became increasingly unfaithful to the Lord. This is that King Ahaz. For he sacrificed the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him, saying, Because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. And so here's his logic. No logic. He, he thought, he thought, well, they helped my enemies. If I serve them, if I sacrifice to them, they may help me. And so we see him falling farther and farther away from the Lord. I will sacrifice to them, but they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. Sin ultimately will ruin us. We have freedom, we have choice, we can make our own decisions, as well we should. But here we see his decisions made apart from the Lord. And his end was ruin. So Ahaz gathered the articles of the house of God, cut in pieces the articles of the house of God, shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, made for himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem, and in every city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense to other gods and provoke to anger the Lord God of his fathers. Here, the king is leading the people away from the Lord. It wasn't enough that he fell away in faith from the Lord himself, but now he's, he's leading the people farther and farther away from the Lord. He's, he's selling items the treasures from the, from the temple, from the house of the Lord. We see in the passage in verse 24, he even shut up the doors, shut the doors of the house of the Lord. He closed the place down. And what did he do instead? He made altars of idols at every corner of Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Every place you go, the house of the Lord, the doors closed with treasures being sold, taken and given away to a foreign king. And here there, he's setting up all these idols around Jerusalem and Judah to worship. 
what happened? Well, it says, and this provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. That's well it should. The Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz. In 2 Chronicles 28 and 19, it says, For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Judah, king of Israel, for he had encouraged moral decline in Judah and had been continually unfaithful to the Lord. As I said at the start, his reign went from bad to worse. Ahaz encouraged moral decline in Judah. And so the New King James Version reads, moral decline. Uh, the term may be translated as a lack of restraint. Ahaz promoted wickedness. Ahaz made Judah act sinfully. Well, ultimately, it would be the people and their decision to act sinfully. But we see how that the king encouraged or promoted this moral decline, promoted this lack of restraint. There was no faith restraining them. There was no fear of God holding them back from sin. There was no fear of God of the judgment of the Lord. Rather than leading Judah and doing what was right in the sight of the Lord, he stripped Judah of the restraints of true religion and led them into idolatry. Ahaz made Judah naked. They stripped them of, of true religion, of faith in the Lord. And, and so their morality declined. There were consequences for Judah. Second Chronicles 28, 6, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. After receiving the commandments, Moses came down, seeing the calf and the dancing of their people. You remember from Exodus 32, where Moses ascends the mount to receive the word of the Lord. He comes down with the commandments of God, the Ten Commandment law. And the people were naked, that, that being that they were lacking restraint, free of restraint. Any restraint was gone. And so they're dancing. They're worshiping the golden calf. And in Exodus 32, 25, Moses uses the same word that we see here in, in Chronicles. Where they, we see the moral decline of the people. Unrestrained. And so now when Moses saw the people were unrestrained. From Moses, for Aaron had not restrained them, and to their shame among their enemies. And so here we see the, the shame of the people, shame brought, brought to the people in, in the presence of their enemies. And Aaron had not done anything to restrain them. In fact, he had promoted it. And so the people were unrestrained. We see their moral decline. As already said, God has always revealed his will in one way or another. Today, we see it in the Holy Scriptures, preserved for us today, his inspired word. However, what happens when people do not fear the Lord? What happens when people do not obey his word? As he's given us revelation, he's revealed his will. Um, we see his inspired word, and yet people will not heed his word all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for proof for correction for instruction in righteousness and so what happens without revelation according to solomon in proverbs 29 18 where there is no revelation the people cast off restraint but happy is he who keeps the law well certainly the people in ahaz's day had not kept the law of moses that was given to Israel. 
we see their idolatry, for instance, among other sin, other transgressions of the law. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. And so without vision, without revelation, the people perish. They perish in their lack of restraint, in their moral decline, in their wickedness. But happy is he who keeps the law. Happy is the person who keeps the word of the Lord. The revelation received in the inspired word given. Ahaz, through his reign, had, had taken away, had stripped Judah of their religion and worship of the true God, the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He did not trust in God. But instead, he trusted in the false gods and led the people to do the same. Isaiah in Isaiah 7 describes how that he told the king that if he, Judah, were faithful to the Lord, that there was nothing to fear from these other kings. But he did not trust in him. The Lord even offered to give him a sign. And he refused, feigning the fear of the Lord. But where was his? fear. He found that such would be tempting God, but there was no tempting God. God gave the offer, offer for him to suggest a sign, which he did not. He did not want to believe. The people became increasingly unfaithful to God and increasingly committed immorality, unrighteousness. We see in the scriptures the warning. And the prophets often gave these warnings. Amos 8 and 11. The prophet Amos wrote, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for the word or for, for water, but the words of the Lord. And so they had experienced times of famine, times of thirst, and sometimes as as judgment for their sins but in this case here we see the word of the lord a famine a thirst not of bread and water but a famine a thirst of hearing the word of the lord how often does that happen desire the word that you may grow peter told the brethren the lord said in hosea 4 1 to 2 he said there is no truth or mercy or knowledge in, of God in the land by swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery. They break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. And so Hosea described the word of the Lord to the people in his day. How that there were people who, who did not follow the truth, who did not speak the truth or practice or show mercy to others as God had showed to them who did not teach and follow the knowledge of God and their land, who showed that they did not follow his knowledge by swearing and lying and killing and stealing, committing adultery. And we see that he said, with bloodshed upon bloodshed, the violence just was worse and worse. People became bloodier and bloodier. And so they lacked restraint without revelation. There is no restraint. Without fear of the Lord. People think that they can be moral without God. And some people can be decent people. Of course, you have to wonder where the morality came from. Did they come up with it on their own? Here, he said in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What kind of knowledge? A lack of knowledge of the word of the Lord. So we see their sin, but their problem can be, become our problem too without a, a knowledge of the word of, of the Lord. What's the answer? The answer is the Holy Scriptures given by our inspiration of God. The word of the Lord must be taught and believed and obeyed. In Deuteronomy 6, for instance, there are two key phrases. Verse 2. Fear the Lord your God 
And in verse five, love the Lord your God. There are different kinds of motivations. One may be fear, another may, may be love. Here we see in verse two, fear the Lord. And so there ought to be this, this reverence for the Lord God. And so not only a fear of judgment, but also a reverence for him as our creator, that he made us, that he sustains us, that he is the heavenly father, and that we love the Lord our God. Verse five, as long as people do not fear God and keep his word, there will be continual decline in morality. Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 3, God told Israel through Moses. Now, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land that you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here, Israel gave the instructions, was given the instructions by God concerning the promised land, and they were to keep the commandments of God, to observe them. In verses four and five, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Here's this great confession of faith of Israel. This reminds me of a passage from Matthew, from Mark 12, where Jesus encountered a man, a scribe, a Pharisee, who had heard how Jesus had answered the Sadducees well and came to test Jesus. The scribe had asked him a question, which is the first commandment of all? That is, what is the great commandment? What's the greatest commandment in the law? Matthew 22, 36. And Jesus said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so he cited Deuteronomy 6, 4 from the law. And he answered the scribe. In Mark 12, 30, he said, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And so this is the great commandment. Love God completely with all your being. Again, the scripture in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. Jesus continued. He said, and the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The second commandment, like the first commandment, is this. He said, love your neighbor as your, yourself. Uh, again, this is also taught by Moses to the children of Israel in Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So this was the law given to the children of Israel. And today it remains true that we ought to love our neighbor as ourselves, even as Jesus taught us here in Matthew 22 and 39. You know, other commandment greater than these. Can, can you imagine being asked this question, considering all the commandments found in the law of Moses? And Jesus picks this commandment. Matthew 22 and 40. In Matthew's account, Jesus said, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. The commandment to love. First, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The best motive for serving God is love, that we love him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so fear the Lord, love the Lord. 
Verse 32, so the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And so when Jesus quoted the, the confession of faith of the law, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, it's explained here by the scribe as, as meaning that there is one God, and that there is no other God but the Lord. If only Ahaz had believed this. The scribe said, well said, teacher. And so he commended his words and he, he repeated the words of Jesus. He showed that Jesus had spoken the truth. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. There were some under the law who offered the sacrifices who continue to sin. But here we see that the scribe even acknowledged that this commandment to love is greater than them all. The scribe repeated the words of Jesus and commented on these words. His teaching evidently had a great impact on the man. And verse 34 says, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. This man, the scribe Pharisee, had come to Jesus to, to question him, to test him. And now he came away with Jesus saying, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Regrettably, this is as far as some ever come. You are not far is not far enough. From the beginning of his ministry, Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, Mark 1, 14. And he preached the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The word gospel means good news. Jesus would give his life and did for our sins. Sadly, it appears that the scribe was as close as he would ever be to the kingdom of God. Note that sharp conjunction, but. But after that, no one questioned Jesus. Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9. Here's the answer given to Israel. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Again, love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so today, while the law was given to Israel, uh, we see that we can learn something from this today, Jew and Gentile, that we teach our children righteousness. We teach them the word of the Lord as they're young, that hopefully when they're older, they'll continue in the faith of the Lord. And so here he said, the words that I command you today shall be in your heart, be in the hearts of the people, and that the people would teach them diligently to their children, that they would talk about them often, uh, frequently during their day, that they'd be a part of their lives. This is what needs to happen today. Real change for the better begins at home. Sometimes parents may think, well, if we love our children, we'll just let our children do whatever they want to do. That's a mistake. Paul told his fellow Christians, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. And so in the New Testament, we see Christians being told to train, to bring their children up in the training, the nurture, and the admonition of the Lord. Teach your children right from wrong. Teach them morality. And this will help offset the 
moral decline of the people, that we would become instead less faithful, more faithful. Set a good example, teach your children, preach the gospel, share the good news with others, that there is hope. Perhaps Ahaz thought that it was over for him, that he didn't believe and, and that he had to do things his way. His way was wrong. We see the gospel is for all, for all people of all nations. Mark 16, 15 to 16, Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And Jesus, verse 18 said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And so in these passages, Jesus giving the great commission. The commission is great because it's for all the world, every nation. Commission, commandment. And so preach the gospel, the good news, salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Give his life for our sins that we may be redeemed. Believe the gospel. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Trust God. In chapter 28, 18 to 20 of Matthew, teach, baptize, and teach. We'll leave you today with a passage from Proverbs, Proverbs 14, 34. It was true in Solomon's day. It was true in the day of Ahaz, and it's true in our day today. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. It would be a, it would be a, a shame to be reproached by other people because of our unrighteousness. Righteousness lifts up or exalts a nation, but sin will debase a people, will bring a people low will be a cause of shame to any people. But there is hope for people who repent. The reign of Ahaz was, was terrible. But thankfully, the kingdom of his son, the reign of his son Hezekiah, was a, was a good king. And he tried. He tried hard to bring the people back to the Lord. And he was successful in some ways. But I think this gives some hope that uh, sometimes the apple does fall far from the tree. And in the case of Hezekiah, he was not like his father, Ahaz. And he led the people. He did what was right in the sight of God. He did his best. We encourage you to do your best today. If you are not a Christian, consider becoming a Christian today. Hear the gospel. Believe. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him and be baptized. If, if you are a Christian but you've been unfaithful, repent of your sins and go to God in prayer. and He will forgive you. Think about these things as we stand in, as we as we serve and we would go to God today. Thank you for being here.